Hi, everybody. It's beautiful Thursday, June 18th, 2020. And on behalf of the Celebrant Foundation Institute, we're really happy to have a collective wisdom call this evening with Zoom. So uh, as our technology, so, and this is being recorded for those people who cannot make it on the call. We have our, an, an, a great conversation ahead of us with accomplished, wise, beloved, long-term colleague celebrant, Jane Hughes Genou, today, which is her 90th birthday, and we are going to celebrate her in a minute. Uh, we are gonna talk with her about her celebrant life and her newly published book, On the Rocks, A Storyteller's Memoir. Now, let me also say, because you got in the invite, everybody, the, the, the cover of the book and how you can get it on Amazon, that, a, uh, that Richard Schiffman, journalist and author, states, Jane's book is not just a memoir, it is a revelation of how the power of spirit has guided and guarded Janu from childhood onward, a real treat. And her other books as well have been much hailed. So I know that uh, you guys got the invite and you have a little bit about this information, but let, let me say now that welcome, Jane, and uh, welcome. We're very happy to have you. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Okay. And uh, what I'd like to do, everybody, now that we've got everybody in, let me just admit one more person, is I think it would be very apropos if we sang our dear Jane, happy birthday. Ready? <laughs> One, you might not see us all, Jane, but we're here, sister. One, I'm very two, small picture three. myself. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, Jane. Happy birthday to you. Hey, hey Jane, <laughs> blow out the candle. <laughs> blow out the candle, Jane. Well, I, I uh, blow out the candle. All yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> you did a great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Wasn't too hard. Okay, so let me let me put Jane on uh, the spotlight here. So she's the center girl now. You're the center girl. So right. uh, I'm in the background. You've been a celebrant for, for years and are one of uh, the celebrant mothers of invention for the celebrant movement. Can you tell <laughs> us how you became a certified life cycle celebrant? How did it happen? Well, um, it's a weird story. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I could just tell you that I heard about celebrancy and, and um, decided I would study and, and uh, join with you, but it's more to it than that, um, really. And, and my life is kind of like this. Um, my father um, was a, an Episcopal priest, and we grew up, um, I grew up in the first 11 years of my life, um, at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City. It's a, an Anglican Episcopal ch church uh, cathedral. And he was headmaster of the choir school and uh, presenter at the cathedral, which meant he was in charge of all the things that happened there. Um, and um, my mother died when I was four. So, uh, that, of course, was an enormous blow. I had two brothers, uh, and but there was nobody really in my immediate life, any female, that I could uh, look up to and um, try to emulate. So um, one, one Christmas, uh, or maybe it wasn't Christmas, but one year when I was about, oh, maybe five years old, um, a friend of my mother's, a dear friend, she used to give me little things every now and then, and she gave me a, 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 a little uh, enameled compact. In those days, women put, used powder, put powder on their nose, and, and they had powder in these little 
um, some of them were very elaborate and some of them were less were more simple but uh, and they used a powder puff so i got this thing and and thanked my godmother for that uh, but then i thought what am i supposed to do with this and then after it sat around and i couldn't think how to play with it or what to use how to use it as a toy but uh, one day it occurred to me that it had a powder puff and about the size of a wafer that Episcopalians and Roman Catholics as well use in the ceremony of the um, Holy Communion in their service. And, um, and so, I, I mean, these ideas sort of came to me one by one, it took a while. But um, after a while, I thought, I, well, this time I was in first grade in school. And um, so I, and my mother had died when I was four. So I was two years uh, without her. And um, I, we had a woman, I had a nurse who, who took care of us, three of my, my two brothers and me. And then um, there was a other woman who came and took care of us um, on our nurse's day off. And uh, she lived on the property and she was a wonderful sewer. And um, so I thought about this a lot, but finally I asked her if she would be willing to get me some um, little powder puffs at the 10 cent store, Woolworths. And we talked about it several times. She wanted to know why I wanted it. And I said, well, it's for a project at school. And um, this went on for quite some time. Finally, uh, I convinced her I didn't think this was a good thing to ask my father to do, and I didn't think it was a good thing to ask my nurse to do. I think she would have uh, not uh, gone along with it. But I thought maybe um, this other woman would help me. So finally she agreed. And, um, and I'd seen these little powder puffs in Woolworths. So I knew they were there and they didn't cost very much. They were very uh, inexpensive. But she finally produced them. There's a whole big package of them, maybe 20. And um, so then I took that uh, to school in my book bag. And I asked the teacher, we had a little cubby in first grade where we kept our sneakers and this and that and odds and ends of things. There's a little um, uh, down underneath the window in, the, in our classroom. And so I took my uh, uh, little, what am I trying to say, Com compact, and these, and these um, uh, uh, what are they called? Um, um, cotton, the, the, the cotton balls. Yes, and, and I went to the, my, I asked for a paper to cover up my little cubby. It was a little box, open box, and down uh, near the floor. And I very carefully arranged, I took, I had the compact in the middle and I arranged all, all these individual um, um, powder puffs in a, a square around this um, little, um, um, what's it called? Uh, um, thing for the holes, the powder puffs, anyway. And I, and I did this very, very, very carefully. It took quite a lot of time. And finally, I said, told the teacher that I was ready. And so she, after a little while, she stopped the class from doing what they were doing and said, now Jane has a surprise for us. So one by one, I called my classmates over to this little cubby and I get, very solemnly gave them one of these little powder puffs. <laughs> and they were confused. Uh, they thought that was a really odd thing to be done doing, but I did it. And I did the whole class and I even gave one to my teacher. And she was very grateful. And or see, it seemed to appear to be very grateful. And, and that was the end of it. Um, and at the end of it, I felt somehow um, that I'd done something I shouldn't have. That was the, that was the feeling that I um, had as a little five, six year old. And, and nobody ever said anything about it. Nobody ever scolded me. Nobody ever inquired about why I'd done that. I think my teacher probably had a clue as to what I was doing. But um, that stayed with me, 
that little um, scene, that moment uh, of giving people these little powder puffs um, in a very serious way. It wasn't anything to joke about or laugh about or play with, but um, that was my effort to somehow um, perform the most sacred act that a the Anglican and Roman Catholic priest does is, is to be able to offer the, the sacrament, as it's called, uh, to the people, to certain people. And that, of course, in those days, women weren't allowed to become priests. And um, so that was, it was unthinkable. But the point is that um, that longing to do something important. I couldn't find anything in my life that women seemed to be able to do that seemed interesting. You know, they were, my mother, who was a very interesting person, but she died. And so, you know, I didn't, it, it was a complicated story and it sort of stayed with my life for quite a while. And um, now, but I just f finished publishing my uh, memoir, which is a, some of the stories of my life. I include that little story because um, it's been with me and I've wondered about it. But I obviously uh, realized when I was, you know, maybe, maybe not even a teenager, that this was my effort to somehow um, do what, uh, perform what I felt and understood was my father's most important um, uh, privilege as a priest. So, but there was nobody I could talk to about this, and there was, you know, it just stayed with me my whole life. And, um, but long came um, uh, the um, Celebrant Foundation. I forget when that, when, when did you start that? We started in 2001. 2001, all right. Yes, so, so it's going back a little bit, a close to 20 years, if not, it's 20 years, yes. Yeah, 20 years, right. Well, um, the, when I heard about that, which I did, I think, pretty soon after it was founded, I don't know, somebody sent me an email, and um, I thought, oh, well now, here's something maybe I can do. And I was doing a number of things, and I was doing workshops and studying and Oh, all kinds of stuff, but um, so I did. I studied as a cel as a uh, applicant to celebrancy, and enjoyed it enormously. It found it very helpful and, and uh, important for me. And but it came. I only I'm one of only, only I'm the only one who really knows that it came from that childhood longing to be um, like my father. To do what he did, did, and and that 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 ability to do that was very 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 important. Didn't know why, but because I was just too too young to understand. But that's the that's the history. And so when I heard about uh, the Celebrancy Foundation, I I joined up and studied, and and of course I already had a lot of um, studied another kinds of spiritual practices. So I, I had some background on um, some of the things that uh, uh, celebrants are called to do. Uh, and I have, I'm not doing an active celebrant right now because I, um, I'm i living in New Hampshire and um, I don't have a car and I used to drive, but I don't have a car up here. So it's, no, it's not easy for me to get around. I can walk anywhere I want and I do. Um, uh, and I can take a bus to New York or Boston, but uh, I'm not really able to be an active celebrant and do ceremonies for uh, individuals or groups or families. But you have for many years, haven't you? you I, have did. Been a, yeah, yeah. I did. Oh, Absolutely. yes, I did that for a you number were, of years. You would go from, yeah, not just New York City area, but in, in a lot of different areas uh, in Connecticut. Yeah. And so uh, I think uh, there's families out there and that have been uh, graced by you being a celebrant. And also I know that even before you were a celebrant, as many of us, you guys, um, it's, it's 
important to say, it's like we were always celebrants, right? It seems like we were, and we found each other. <laughs> we're definitely a tribe that have, you know, embraced this concept of, uh, of being celebrants all our life. So it's so great to have Jane explain some of the history to her, to us. And um, we may also have moments in our lives, right, that we see as a little tipping point. And it may be go back to when you're six. So let me ask you this, uh, uh, Jane, because we, Jane and I worked out some questions, so we're, we're good with this. In addition to being a celebrant and an activist and all these wonderful things that were on the, the invite, you are also an author who has written and published books that focus on end of life. And these books, and we're happy that we, ha we have been able to read them as well, some folks say story of life, death, and beyond, and also a book, An Insistence on Life. Can you tell us a little bit about these books and what made you create them? Oh, I certainly, I'd love to. Um, well, I was living in New York. I, I married and raised four children and, and, and that, almost, that story of, of uh, my marriage uh, coming to an end is in my new book. But, and I won't go into it here, but I, um, very dramatically, I, I was, got the word that I needed to uh, leave my marriage. And it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole life. But anyway, and I did, I came back to New York City where I had been raised. And um, I uh, started studying with uh, different healers and people who were interested not not necessarily in religion in that sense, in the traditional sense, but they were interested in helping people um, be, become whole, become find what it is that they seem to have lost or uh, whatever it was. And I studied with a lot of different number of different people, and um, and then I heard about uh, the Celebrancy Foundation, and uh, I'd already, been, as I say, was studying with some other some healers, some people who are um, working in different forms of, of spirit, spiritual practice. And, um, but when I found about um, the celebrants, uh, I just signed up. It just seemed obvious. It seems, um, I'd already sort of gone through the door, one door, the heavy door. And now when I found out about celebrancy, it, it just seemed obvious. Uh, that that's where I, I should put some of my attention, and I did. You sure did, and you also hosted Death Cafes, which were amazing. I've been that's to right. the ones in New York City. You were pioneering them. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us about well, the books that you use, that you wrote as well. Some folks say an, an insistence on life. Well, uh, some folks say um, is the first one, and. The, the story there is that I have a friend at the time. I had a friend in New York. She was much younger than me, a whole generation younger than me. I just turned 90 uh, today. Hey! Uh, but anyway, this, this, was, this was 30 years, 35 years ago. Um, and she told me, she's not a, she, she's not a nurse. She's not a, a um, doctor. But she told me that she that there were people uh, that she was working with, uh, working with them. I think just talking to them and trying to help them who had AIDS, and um, and she found in that uh, informal kind of work that there were children who lived up at Harlem Hospital who had AIDS, newborns and young children, and. Uh, the doctors had no idea. Those in those days, the early days of AIDS, there were no um, medications. There were no virus uh, way to control the virus. Nobody knew what it was. It was a really hard time. It's, it's a little bit like what we're been going through now mm -hmm. with the uh, coronavirus. Um, but um, when I heard this, that these these were brand new babies, and very often their mothers died, or they were so overcome by their situation that they left the hospital without their babies oh my oh my well, that's how, that's how that's how uh, because you know nobody would deal with them nobody the doctors didn't know what to do they were very kind uh, but they they didn't have anything to 
uh, offer them that would, might help them. So when I heard that from my um, uh, friend, my in my heart, I just said, oh, nobody should be abandoned. Now that, if any of you know, have ever had uh, lost your mother when you were a child, that's the experience of having a mother die. It's an experience of abandonment. Any psychologist uh, or doctor will tell you that. Now, I didn't know that. Uh, I just, that's what happened. I had this voice in my head that said, nobody should be abandoned. So I went straight up to Harlem Hospital the next day and um, uh, volunteered. And I was there for, I think, 18 years or more. And with the HIV children. Yeah. Oh, wonderful years, wonderful oh, years. My. And it was during that time, I realized the early days, some of them were newborns, of course, but some of them were, were kids and there were even teenagers there. Um, they were not afraid of death. Nobody told them to be afraid. Nobody taught them to be afraid of death. And so there was a, the, the hospital had hired a psychologist, psychiatrist to help these families because it was, if you remember, some of you may remember the early days of AIDS. It was a very difficult time. It's very stressful. Um, anyway, what happened was, um, and actually the psychologist that I got to know there, he said, you know, some he was having trouble with a kid who was in the um, teenager and he wanted to read him a, a story about death. He couldn't find anything appropriate for a kid. And he said, I'm going to write a book with tells people what happens when you die. And as he said that, something inside of me exploded. And I said, oh, Michael, I want to help you with that project. So we set to work. I, New York is a wonderful place to do research. There are lots and lots of museums and libraries. And I spent a great deal of my time at the Metropolitan Museum Library. Mm. Um, enormous. And the, the uh, uh, People there, librarians knew who I we got to know who I was and what I was doing, and they would they would help me. Librarians are wonderful. If you've ever done any research, they because what they love more than anything else is digging out something that's hard to find. <laughs> so anyway, I um, put together. I found dozens and dozens of stories, and these were stories. Um, many of them from different parts from Africa, this, different parts of uh, this continent and Europe and Asia. Uh, they were, uh, some of them were th thousands of years old. Uh, they have no author, of course. Um, they've been passed down. And there's uh, there, there masses of folk tales and stories on any subject you want. Um, but this, I was looking for stories about death. And um, Anyway, to make a long story short, I kept finding them and, and I got myself a computer and figured out how to use it. And um, after, I don't know, about five or 10 years, I, um, uh, I published a book called Some Folk Say Stories of Life, Death, and Beyond. And I found, and I knew this book had to be very colorful and alive because people were terrified of death. Most people, a lot of people can't say the word death. They talk about passing on. Yes, they can't. They they can't say so and so died. It's got to be they passed on. You're right. Anyway, <laughs> so so um, uh, I knew that it needed to be colorful because um, I myself had a difficult time learning to read. I I was dyslexic and I didn't learn to read till third grade. But I love to look at the pictures and imagine what the story was. So. I realized this would be very important to make it uh, a picture book. And, um, and so I was looking for a, 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 what do you call a publisher at the time, but I was, you know, nobody knows who I am. I've never written a book before. Nobody's gonna, a, a color picture uh, book is an expensive deal. And so I realized, you know, you just have to do this yourself. Take some of your money and, and spend it on this project. And I was on fire about it. So I did. And um, it's a hardcover. Has, I found a wonderful illustrator. I went to the library uh, of, uh, what's it called? Um, illustrators. They have enormous, huge books. 
full of, of uh, samples of illustrations of people who will illustrate for books. And uh, I just looked through there until suddenly, bang, there it was. I knew this was the right person. I got a picture of it here, folks. Of the see book? how beautiful oh. it is? I don't know if you can see this, Jane, but I'm oh, just going to open the yeah, book I'm now. Get mine. I've got a copy of mine here, too. Um, so he not only, I talked to him on the phone and um, I told him what I wanted and I sent him some of the stories and so forth. And he, he sent back some marvelous, marvelous suggestions. We worked together, um, I never met him, but we worked together and, uh, very well. And uh, I think there are about eight or 10 um, illustrations for eight or 10 stories. The cover, of course, um, is the jacket is, is another marvelous picture. And because it needs, this, the visual needs to attract people to a subject that they're terrified of without Absolutely. even knowing why. And um, <laughs> so uh, that's, that's how it all began. And um, by that time I, you know, studied a lot and traveled a lot and done a lot of things that I, um, uh, and when this book came out, um, there were not. There were. There were not. There were, there were quite a few doctors and nurses and psychologists and 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 counselors of various kinds who were really interested in this because they they were very well aware of how people are so terrified of death, and uh, well, death is your birthright. Death is your birthright. Nobody gets One. out of this life alive, and um, so anyway, I. That's how it all got started. And um, and I was that was long before I heard about had heard about celebrants. Um, and the second book is um, the paperback, the one that's an, an, an insistence on life. Um, that one is a, is a uh, collection, smaller collection of stories of real life people dealing with death, not their own or somebody else. It might be a family member, it might be a spouse, it might be some dear friend, um, but it was their story. And um, so what I found is that people, when they read these stories, they it just it, it let go of a great burden because first of all, these most of the people in this country, still even, uh, not, all, not as much as it was when I started this, but they, um, you, can't, you couldn't talk about death. People passed away. And that's very hard. Very painful to not talk about something that is part of your life. I mean, nobody gets out of this life alive, and not just humans, all forms of life. Think about it. Anyway, um, that's how that started, and um, and I and that's then is the the death cafes that we came over from Europe and England. Uh, that process of getting people sitting people down in a room and just talking about death. It's not there. No, I mean I hosted death cafes. I'd heard about them on tele, um, television and on the public radio. Um, but I didn't invent it at all, the process. But for years I had um, hosted death cafes in New York City. People would come to my living room and sit down. I'd give them a cup of tea and, and a cookie and we'd talk about death. I'd read one of the stories and some folks say, <laughs> one of the shorter stories. And, uh, but they had stories about questions of when they were young or questions about their grandmother or whatever it was they had um they they all had the reason they came is they had something they didn't understand in their past and and still uh confusing them in their present so um that is now a worldwide movement the world cafes people all over the world show up at these little gatherings sometimes they're in libraries sometimes they're in churches or mosques or synagogues uh, sometimes they're 
you know, in classrooms or whatever. I mean, they're, wherever you are, some people, I went to one in New York that uh, was in a cafe, you know, so that you, this woman to, uh, uh, got herself a table and held, I guess, 10 people or something like that. And everybody go get their cup of tea and a biscuit or whatever and sit down and we talk about that for two hours. I think that actually quite a few of our celebrants, I think if, if you guys are on the phone and you're not familiar with this, um, when we, John Underwood was very instrumental in getting the Death Cafe uh, movement going forward. And we spoke with him and had him on for uh, conference calls. I have his videos. And he died a couple of years ago. He was ill and he died, a young man too. But uh, he had actually said to us that he's so happy and proud of the celebrants and said, you guys are doing it right. So um, he gave us the information and said, hey, you guys are, you, you have the expertise, please, he said, have celebrants that are interested, be able to host them wherever they are. So if anyone's on this call that would like to host the Death Cafe, we do have the information from John Underwood, one of the people that I consider one of the originators. And I've been to Jane, Jane's gatherings in New York, and I have to tell you, they, um, he, she really offered a service to the community uh, that's amazing. And I'm sure that all of your communities would prosper for them. And I think there's celebrants on this call today that offer death cafes. Now, let me, let's get to, because I, I know we have a little bit of time uh, that we want to be able to speak with you about your memoir. Can you talk about On the Rocks, a storyteller's memoir? And also let us know, um, you know, what the whole process was, why you, um, you, wrote this book and also maybe there is an interest for celebrants uh, what would the fit be it's a, what, the fit was be, what, what was the question the question was talk to us a little bit about your book the memoirs and how it came to be let's start with that yeah well i can ask that but um okay i i often do things and Invariably, not everything, but a lot of things I do intuitively. I just find myself suddenly uh, walking down this path or picking up this thing or whatever it is, and, and it leads to something yeah. else, something larger. Now, I, mean, I think that's not uncommon, um, but um, the, the business of writing this book, I, I, uh, I think before I had the idea of writing um, a book about death, uh, spoke tales about death. Um, I was troubled, a lot of things that troubled me about my life. My mother had died when I was four. Uh, so I, I mean, I had a very early experience of, of death. And um, so I, I was wondering, you know, at, at times I'd say, I, I need to straight, I don't really understand this. And so I want to write it down. Well, finally, it wasn't until, oh, I was in my, I don't know, 40s or something, uh, that I, I started writing, making a story uh, of, of how this happened or that happened or the other happened. And um, not that that, um, well, it's not, it did actually. In, in many cases, it helped me understand something that was very confusing, had been very confusing. Um, and um, so the, the, that's really how this book, some folks say, evolved. The first two books I wrote were about helping people uh, come to understand why we have death. And indigenous people around the world, it turns out, because of these are stories with no author, they, they just are told and told over the centuries. When I was doing my research, I, um, I often found the same story in a different part of the world, told a little bit differently, but it's basically the same story. And, uh, and, and that's quite understandable. Um, but um, because, it, you know, death is, it happens, it happens in different ways, but it's the people around and, and the whole family that, and, and sometimes not so much family, more friends, but um they they have they experience something that's quite mysterious you've ever been with somebody who's dying 
One moment they're there and then they're not there. Their body is there. That's the whole thing. But, the, but their spirit, it's a non-material part of life. That's what life is, it's non-material. Quite, it's quite extraordinary until you really face it and look at it. But anyway, um, so that's how those books started, uh, why they started. And um, then I started, when, since I'd written the books, and, I, and, they, and stories are wonderful ways to engage people. People love stories. Children love them, adults love them. A couple of people here were dying. I gave them a copy of my first book. Uh, some folks say, and they read it, some of the stories, or their, they, one of their family members would read stories, and they loved it right up to the day they were dying, you know? And um, so I think that's really, that's what got me going on, on um, putting stories together. Uh, I mean, I wasn't trying to uh, be a novelist. I never had an interest in that. I, my background in, in my uh, schooling was in theater and of course storytelling is a form of theater it's a form of um, explaining and, and showing and demonstrating and helping people experience what is happening what's going on you are a great you know? storyteller Jane and also you have a beautiful voice and I think all of us feel that yeah that's definitely it does not surprise us <laughs> And maybe many celebrants are storytellers too. So we thank you for tipping your hat to theater and storytelling because let's face it, this is our, our human roots. Yeah. So uh, I, I, that's, that's a little bit of how I got started on, on um, dealing with death. And of course, helping me understand my own death, my own mother's death and and which, of course, when I was four years old, I certainly didn't understand. It's a, and that's an experience of abandonment, yeah. Um, yeah. as any psychologist will tell you, and um, or, or any person who has any sense at all. Uh, you know, when your mother suddenly goes away and doesn't, doesn't come back, that's what you call abandonment. And particularly when you're living in a, a boys' school of 40 boys and, and two brothers. That's not easy. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's uh, that's really how I got started on writing, and and uh, the uh, I think in a lot of it I found is that by writing something down, I help it, it helps me explain it to myself. You know, there's a lot that goes on in life, and um, that, and in fact, I was just uh, writing about that earlier. Um, there's a lot that goes on in life that we don't understand. I don't understand a lot of what happened to me when I was young, but I've, I eventually did figure it out. You know what it was about, what it was um, trying, what I was trying to find out. I'm sure that's true of anybody. In my workshops that I've given over the years around country. Um, oh, I've I worked in the federal prisons for a number of years. I've worked in uh, just all over the country in different kinds of places. But out west, I remember, uh, I think it was maybe in Wyoming, um, I gave a workshop and there were a bunch of cowboys there, I gotta tell you, they were something. <laughs> and, um, well, you know, they have the boots and they have the hat and they have, and, um, and because I, my background is in theater, I don't do all the talking. I get the, the people to do the talking and, and, and I get them to act out things and, and because that's a very powerful way to explain something to yourself. Why? Why were you so frightened of this, this event and so forth? Anyway, at the end of one of my workshops, this great, big, wonderful, burly, handsome, um, cowboy came up to me and he didn't say a word. Now I'm not even five feet anymore, but he was good, well over six feet, but he bent over and he gave me this enormous big bear hug. Didn't say a word. 
boy. I mean, that said a lot. It said a lot about him. It said a lot about, you know, what that he had really, he was so grateful. And I've seen this happen over and over and over and over in, in uh, death cafes, evenings, and in workshops, which are more extended experiences. People leave with their shoulders are relaxed, their head is held higher, they're yeah. feeling, they've, they've let go of something that's really tough that was holding them back. Beautiful. I think we've all had that experience, whether we had it in a guided situation or just on our own. Uh, and maybe not all, but most people have. And um, so that's really what, um, what I find is helpful, is to help people get into places where they haven't been able to get into in about their own life. Dig around. And then what you find, you don't find some dreadful, scary, miserable, terrible thing. You find peace. You find love. That's yeah. pretty good. You got you it, know? sister. Mm -hmm. Can and you tell us? This, can you tell us a little bit about your book as well? Your your latest book, your memoirs. Oh, the memoir. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I started writing pieces. Uh, this was just a few years ago. These other two books were way right back. Uh, when did some folks say it was in? Um, 80, 80, 98, something like that. It's, it's, it's over 20 years ago, and um, maybe 25 when I first started. Anyway, um, this one just came out, uh, but what it, um, it, the stories are told, and the stories are in there because I experienced, I, I, I needed to write down some things that had happened to me and I needed to understand them myself. I didn't understand them. And sometimes I'd understand them when I sat, got into a hot bath, uh, uh, you know, on a freezing cold night. Uh, and then suddenly the, the, the meaning of whatever the event was came out. Um, but I wanted, to, I wanted to make it clear. And it was, you know, life, life is confusing. I think we all have, bits of our lives that we don't understand and that we uh, don't make sense. And, um, and that's why people go to psychologists and psychiatrists, therapists, is to help them make sense out of whatever it is that doesn't make sense. You know, you see children all the time. Mommy, how come, how come, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so I started writing some of these stories. I didn't think about a book. I just wanted to explain this to myself. So I wrote it down. And, um, and then it, what happened when I had done this a few times, maybe half a dozen times, um, I realized, you know, you, these are, a lot of these are about death. And the experiences of death Death is a separation. It doesn't have to be a physical death, you know, being put in a grave and buried in the ground. It, but it can be the death of a relationship or the death of um, something that was important to you and is no longer important. And sometimes people get very conflicted in those kinds of situations. Uh, but death is natural. <laughs> Everything dies. Everything, everyone. And um, at least on this planet. I don't know about other planets. Um, so I think that um, what I found with writing the stories for some folks say, it, I had a lot of them written, oh, maybe 
at least 10, 12 years ago, some of them, not a lot, some of them. And then I realized that I could put this together in a, um, in a way that would maybe be helpful to people, to other people. This is before that, it had just been me writing um, like a journal writing, but it wasn't a journal. Um, anyway, so uh, since I'd already published two books, I knew how, what the pop process is, and I understood, uh, you know, I wasn't starting from scratch. Um, but I became more and more interested in having the book um, be something that uh, people would be, it would be helpful to people. You know, it's not, uh, and I'm still working on, I just, it's just come out recently. And I'm, I still haven't got all the uh, publicity part of it together, uh, but we're working with uh, some, with a, um, a group and my daughter who lives in France. That's a wonderful thing about, um, you know, you can talk. I talk to my daughter in France maybe two or three times a week. And, um, but if you have, you know, um, unlimited phone calls, it doesn't, nothing, you know, it's nothing. So, uh, I mean, I could, I could use a Zoom if I wanted to, but I don't. We don't. We, uh, it's fine. We, we do fine with the phone. But um, it's been great fun putting these um, stories together and, um, and seeing how they um, are received by people. You know, I have somebody who came to me, um, um, oh, I don't know, a few months ago, six months ago, let's say, you know, young fellow. Well, he's not that young, but he's in his maybe 30s, and, and I think that is very young, but that's because I'm 90. <laughs> and uh, anyway, but he was obviously troubled about something, and he, he was in the middle of reading my memoir, uh, some folks say. And um, I, I think what was going on is he was recognizing some, and he, he was a musician. He had no interest in any of the things that I was um, talking about, but um, something got to him in a way that he couldn't even explain to himself. I won't go into any details about this guy, but, um, and so he, was trying to find his way into his own story, I think is what it was. Uh, and I think he still is. He's, he's not very healthy right at the moment, but, um, and I think that happens a lot to people who are um, just ordinary people in life. They may be very good at what they do. They may be happily married and have children and so forth, but um, there may be parts of their life, part something about their life or their parents or their cousins or whoever, that it, it doesn't make sense or that troubles them or it hurts or whatever. And so they um, find reading, going to movies, uh, whatever, all kinds of experiences, maybe just walking in the woods, um, can help people get in touch with something that's unresolved in their own life. And that's why people go to go to shrinks, go to therapists. Well, you know what? I always like to call shrinks expansionists instead of shrinks. <laughs> yes, this is a terrible. Uh, <laughs> and that's that was made up, of course, by skeptics. And um, uh, I, I I hope by now most of those skeptics have been. Um, uh, They've They've been, yeah, they, they see the light. Yeah, we got a question for you. Today is your 90th birthday. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to share with us, like pearls of wisdom or whatever you wish? Maybe tell us what you have going on. Is there a next project that you're working on? Well, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to write any more books, but um, <laughs> okay. one. Um, um, project that I've had in my mind for a long time. My first book um, is a hardcover, as I said, and um, 
it has uh, all these wonderful stories and, and pictures, not all of them, but I think eight or 10 of them have pictures. And um, I, because of the way publishing goes in the old days, nowadays you can go um, on Amazon and write a book and, and they all just, if it's a soft cover book, um, they just print it and when you order it. In other words, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> on demand or a, something. Right, barns full of, uh, uh, you know, hardcover books that are sitting there. So, however, my second book, my first book, um, I had, a, I forget how many books I had printed the first printing. I mean, I was a novice and I didn't know anything about it, but I um, I think I had about a thousand or maybe 2000 printed. Uh, it was not a subject that wasn't gonna be a bestseller, obviously. That wasn't the yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Along, but we'd be surprised one day it may be not 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 well anyway um and then we ran out after less than a year i was do doing workshops all over the um country here and there places and um so we ran out so i went back to the printer uh who had printed them and he uh was a very good you know, reputable printer and well-known. And, uh, but he was backed up. He couldn't print any more books for another year. He had so many oh orders. But he said, um, and he, he was a big outfit. And uh, he said, well, I have a, uh, one of my um, uh, printing uh, locations is down in Mexico. I, they could do it for you. So I thought, well, okay. Uh, people can print in Mexico as well as they can print in the United States. So I had, yeah, That's the, great. you know, I know there's a lot of prejudice about um, Mexicans and, uh, by not everybody, but some people. And um, so anyway, I had another thousand printed. And about that time, um, it, it, the, the interest in some folks say came to a halt because I wasn't doing um, the kind of promotion I should have been doing. Anyway, so I now have, I don't know, 700 copies of, um, some folks say, some of them are sitting right here in this room in a closet, and some of them, my younger son who lives over in Vermont, has them in his barn, all carefully wrapped up in plastic so they won't, the weather won't get into them. Um, and um, so my, I've been thinking about this for now because that came out in um, 98, I think it is. Um, and um, I thought the places where I've, I've uh, engaged with people on, on this book have been very successful. People have loved it. They have it's helped them enormously. And so I need to go back there and uh, see if I can't um, spread that in some way. Well, you, said some, some, you had mentioned to me that you wanted to take some of your books and bring them back to the folks in the prison system. Yes, exactly. One of the places that where I started early on, uh, when the book first came out, I got a, a letter from an inmate in a prison, federal prison in Florida, and he just read one of my stories in a magazine that had been they taken and printed. It was in the public domain, so um, uh, not my story, but um, and he was Native American. And he, he was so excited about it. So um, he said, where can I find more stories like this? And I said, I'll send you a copy of my book. And I knew I was gonna be in Florida that summer. This was maybe in March or maybe February, or I don't know, um, early in the year. And I was gonna be down there in July or maybe August for a conference. So I didn't know where this prison was, but it was a federal prison. and. Um, so I think, you know, how big is Florida? So turns out that um, it's maybe 40 minutes away from the, where this, uh, workshop, this uh, conference was gonna be. And um, so I, the inmate who was, I was in touch with, he got in touch with one of the counselors and so forth. And I got a formal invitation to go down there and I did. And they loved it. About 50 guys showed up for the first time and, uh, you know, I never worked in a prison. Um, I didn't know anything about prisons. I didn't know anything about how to, but I do know about death. 
I mean, I'd spent a lot of years exploring it. I didn't, I don't mean I was, a, you know, an expert. I'm just saying I knew that everybody is something, not anything you can say isn't part of your life. I got, got it. that. <laughs> and so, <laughs> anyway, I did a lot of work. In, I worked in about at least half a dozen different federal prisons. Uh, most of them were um, low security um, prisons. Some of them were high security, uh, medium security, and then there's the high security. Those are the murderers. And I worked in one of those, one or two, I think. And because uh, the, the, the uh, wardens and the counselors would push me on to, to another prison. Uh, oh, they, nice. They thought this was really effective work. And um, and I didn't know anything. I say all I knew was about folk tales and and um, my life, what my life had taught me, and schooling that I've had. I've worked with healers and so forth. But anyway, so I would like now. I'm going to dig out all my files about the that I have on those prisons because no, those prisoners. This was about 20 years ago. Um, they may be out of prison. They may be dead. They may, but the, the prisons go on, and I'd like to see if I can find um, some of the counselors uh, who understand that stories can be very helpful for people who are trying to. Uh, change their life. Now, a lot of people in prison are. They're trying to figure out why they're there in the first place and on and on. But they're, they're thinking, and they have a lot of time. Yeah. Hmm. So, they were really, it was a great, wonderful experience. So, my project now is to uh, see if I can get back in touch with some of those prisons. I went out to some one in the Midwest and so forth. Um, to offer them copies of my book for free, but not just to have them sit there on the shelf, but I think they need a little bit of... Um, um, you need a storyteller. <laughs> yeah, storyteller and, well, also people who have worked with, um, worked in prisons and know that many, many, many um, people who are in prison are, need help. You know, yes. We, we, and one of the things that we all need help about is death. Whether you think so or think you, you may not think that. I mean, I live in a in a senior residence here. Um, they ran away from death cafes. Ah. They, they don't want to know anything about death here. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Oh boy! Oh boy. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna open up with some questions here for folks. So, uh, Jane's here. She, we've got her on the spotlight. So, if, would anybody like to ask a question? Of you? I know it's coming up to an hour now in a few minutes. So, if you have a couple questions, I think, and I don't want to tire her out either, because uh, she's definitely been the storyteller tonight. Is there anything anyone like to jump in and ask Jane? By all means, please do. I'd like to ask Jane to speak about On the Rocks, the, her, the, the latest book. Um, not so much a question, but I mean, it even occurred to me, is there, would you like to read uh, something from it? A sentence? Oh my goodness. Wait a minute, let me get a hold of a copy. Okay, you got her on the roll now. Yeah, because- <laughs> Who's speaking? Marjorie, Mudra. Thank you, Marjorie, thank you, love. That movie? Okay. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, we can all sit back. Story time. Now, you, you want a story from On the Rocks? Yes. What kind of a story? What's how, the... about, how about what the title's uh, based on? The story of saving that woman. That's a good oh, one. Oh, yes. Okay. The, the cover of the book, uh, if you can, uh, I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, that's um, good. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right. Well, it has uh, uh, some rocks, ocean rocks, and um, a great enormous um, spray of of surf coming up over the rocks into the air and and beating on the on the rocks, the shore. The the rocks that uh, this event, this uh, story that this book uh, uh, takes its. Uh, experience from is um, 
in Rhode Island. And it's a place that I've been going. I was taken as a child along with other friends and their children. And, um, and it's private property. And we'd go swimming. And we were invited um, after church on Sunday, a very sort of conservative sort of an idea. But anyway, we'd go there for a swim. And now people go, I haven't been in a couple of years now, but uh, people people that I went with are half of, most of them are dead, but um, uh, their children and, and their children's children uh, go there. And um, it has, uh, the open ocean comes in into this little cove and, and the rocks uh, are, uh, they're pudding rock. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's rock that has been um, churned up over the millennia and uh, there are little round rocks bedded, embedded into what were probably volcanic uh, rock pebbles. That, uh, so it's, it's very, it's unusual kind of a um, spot, but I was used to swimming there since I can remember really. And um, I loved it. It's, it's kind of adventurous. It wasn't a beach. It wasn't a swimming pool. Um, it, it would, you'd walk down and get, and there were sort of little steps that took you into the uh, into the water, and you jumped off, and there you were. And um, now, what, when you're just learning to swim, you've got a parent or somebody who helped you get it across to the other side. But anyway, this particular um, on the rocks came. This, this story and the, uh, the name of this book uh, happened, um, oh, 35 years ago, maybe. Um, I was um, there, I think I had some of my children there. I have four children, but I, they, they weren't all there, but I think there were a couple of people, uh, a couple of my kids and um, uh, many friends. It was just, it was a private, property. It wasn't a public beach or anything like that. And uh, so the, you knew the people who were there. And um, I sat down, said hello, and, and we all sat down, you know, on the, on the rocks and chatted on a Sunday morning and um, after church. And uh, this particular day, it wasn't very sunny, actually. It was a uh, um, kind of a gloomy day. But anyway, um, after a little while of talking, my, I said I was going to go for a swim. And it was a friend of mine there who I've known all my life. His parents, so, mother, fathers were friends for two generations back and so forth. And um, so he was there and he was, he said he was going to go for a swim too. And he took his babysitter with him. He has some children who were younger than my children. And um, so anyway, we went down and it was a kind of, um, people were saying, you be careful now, there's quite a bit of surf. And um, so I said, oh, don't worry, I have the cross chest parry. And um, the um, uh, people laughed at that, which is actually true. I, the, year, the summer before I had taken um, a life-saving course from a com professional, and, um, and he taught us how to, um, it, it's quite complicated because most, what happens is when people are in, not able to swim, swim properly, they, they grab hold of whoever is near and try and push him under so they can climb up on top of him. That, I mean, believe me, that's what happens. So anyway, so we all got in the water and, and I was chatting with my friend, Paul, about this and that, and I looked over at this woman who was the um, uh, babysitter, and she looked really panicked. She, I mean, I could tell by her eyes. She, so I said, are you having trouble? And she sort of nodded her head, and I said, well, I'll come over. Don't worry, I'll, I'll help you. So I swam over towards her, and of course, the minute I got within sight of her, or not sight, but within reach of her, she reached out and tried to push me under exactly what I was warned about when I was taking the class, the, the training about uh, how to help a person who was drowning. And so I realized, I, I got out from under her and I said, now don't worry, I'm gonna save you. Don't, you know, don't do that again. 
and I got behind her and uh, where she couldn't get at me. She kept trying to turn around and, uh, you know, grab hold of me. But I, I had been trained and I knew what to do. So I got a, my hand across her chest, and talking to her quietly and calmly. And we weren't that far from the, from the rocks. But she was really, really, really panicked. I think she probably only swam in beaches uh, a little bit. Or, anyway, um, she was a babysitter for my friend, as I said. And I'd never met her before, didn't know anything about her. But um, we started for the, we weren't that far from the edge of the rocks. But um, anyway, we got, I got her to the edge of the rocks and there was big heavy surf, not as high as the source that's on the cover of the book, but it was, it was heavy surf. And so every time I'd get her to the edge of the rock and try and push her up, because it was fairly steep, um, the, 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 the water would start to um, pull out again, the undertow. And of course she would try and turn on me uh, to get, you know, some support. And um, we'd, we'd be, we'd be uh, forced, forced out again, out of the cove and, and um, uh, not able to land. So I tried this three or four times and I was very, very quietly saying now, just uh, take it easy, take it easy, so whatever I've been trained. And, um, but what I was, I realized after about the fourth time of doing this, um, I was running out of strength. This really uh, panicked me because I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? Nobody else seemed to, mean, seemed to under, be watching or paying attention up on, sitting up on the rocks. They were all chatting with one another. Oh my. My friend, what? Oh my. Yeah. Oh my, right. My friend Paul, who I was swimming with, he, he was having trouble himself. Um, <laughs> he saw what was going on and he tried to help push uh, uh, Gladys, this woman was, name, her name was, help push her up and, and, and then he couldn't do it. And I heard him say, oh, sorry, Jane. You know, in other words, he was dashed out to sea too. So this happened, as I say, three or four times and I was running out of strength and I thought, oh my God. Um, what, what am I going to do? So I um, just pulled my, my inner self together and not, you know, away from panic and saying, okay, you can do this. And so I um, tried once more time, one more time. And um, we got into the um, shore and the thing was, there were a lot of barnacles on these rocks uh, below, uh, below the uh, uh, waterline. And barnacles, if you ever encountered them, are like razors. And, um, and then there was seaweed, of course, which is like uh, slime. I mean, it's very um, slippery. So the combination is lethal. Okay, so if I, one more time, and I just, summoned up all the strength and more than I thought I ever had. And we went back up and, and I waited for the, you know, for the water to be headed back on shore. And um, I th thrust her up and up sort of over my head. And I said, hang on. Yeah, yelled at her, hang on. And by that time I got her well above the water line. So she was out of the barnacles. But I was in the waterline and I was hanging on for me was um, right in the barnacles. And, uh, but I, I did hang on and I got myself um, up out of the water, exhausted. I mean, my strength was just spent. And I went and lay down on the place where I'd lain down before, where I'd been lying before. And I looked over to see where this woman was. I, I don't think I even knew her name at that point, but um, I could see that my friend Paul was looking after her and taking care of her. He had rescued himself. And um, so I just collapsed, sat there. And I, I was there, I sat there for about two hours. I don't think I moved. And a lot went on in my head. And the thing that was so 
uh, astonishing for me. First of all, I mean, assuming that this is when I was, I was an adult, I wasn't a teenager, I was, a, I don't know, 40, 50. Um, and so what was so shocking was that I went from, you know, being very familiar with this place and having, um, knowing how to handle it and how to swim, get in and out, and no fear and so forth, to suddenly panic. And um, I couldn't quite, I couldn't figure out how that had happened so fast. I couldn't, and, but uh, when I came to write the story, um, I realized that what my experience was, is that I was being, um, this surf water was so powerful that it was thrusting me almost on purpose against the rocks. So I needed to find a visual for the cover of this book. And I, the, the actual rocks where they are in Rhode Island, um, it's not like that at all. And um, even on a rough day, I might have, I might have found it, be able to take a picture of a rough day and been satisfied, but I wasn't about to wait for, you know, three years for that to happen. And so, um, I, I, since I'm living up here in New England, um, I, I thought, well, goodness, there are lots of rocks along the coast of Maine. And I used to live in Maine, so I'm well, well aware of that. So anyway, eventually I found a, uh, this picture, a uh, photograph taken off, um, uh, what's the name of that park uh, right there on the coast? Um, not Scooter Point, but... Uh, well, anyway, um, I found this picture. I found the, the resource where, who had the rights to it and so forth and so on. And it's very different from the conditions that I was, but what looks, what is the same is what was going on in my head. So, uh, you know, nobody is gonna know that it's different from where it actually happened. <laughs> what I wanted was the, the drama of the power of that water beating on the shore. And uh, so that's how that happened. It must have been life changing for you, huh? Well, it was. And, um, you know, a lot of these experiences are, are, are life changing. And, and the, some of them are, you know, not, not so dramatic, but uh, you go from not understanding anything at all to making p peace with it, making friends with it. And <coughs> there is nothing more um, beautiful than that. I have had people over and over and over, as I've said, in workshops who obviously have had something that they've been holding on to and terrified, afraid of and and, and not be able to understand, had it released in the process of uh, doing the workshop. And, and, and this, the gratitude is just extraordinary. No words, mostly, mm. just release. Release of something that was troubling them and troubling them deeply. Then sometimes they didn't even know. So I think, um, that's that's a, a little bit about that story, and um, and I think pictures often um, can help us get into places that <coughs> our intellectual minds can't reach. You know, Jane, we want to thank you for this time together. Is there? If, I I can take one last question because we're actually in an hour and a half. Uh, is okay. there one last question that anybody has? Otherwise, we're going to wish Jane a happy birthday and, and, and go and, and, and let her call her family. <laughs> anybody? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Well, thank you, Jane, and happy birthday. We, we love you, and we thank are you. very happy about your memoirs book. And when you and I spoke over the week, you had said that, you know, there's a certain way to, to write a memoir. If there's anyone on this call that would like to speak to Jane uh, at a different time, by all means, uh, she'll be able to talk about that. But I think we got such a great uh, opportunity to just 
sit back and relax and, and, and listen to you and learn from you. Thank you, Jane. Everybody, let's give her a big hand. Yay. We love you, Jane. Thanks. Thank have, a, you, Jane. have a lovely evening, and Thank we will you. send you the recording. And anybody wants to share this with their friends and family, family, well, by golly, we'll have the recording soon. Thanks again, Jane. Thank you, Sean. Well, thank you for having me. I've enjoyed it. Oh, and, um, okay. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. 90 thank years old. 80 years old. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anybody. Bye. Don't tell anybody, Jane. Bye. We'll never believe you. Bye. You're a Bye. spring chicken, sister. <laughs> we love you. Thanks for organizing this right. shirt. Jane. <laughs> yeah, great to see you. Thank you. Yes, it's great to see everybody. Yeah.